School of Law, 2002 to 2004. And uh, it's your template. And uh, specificity is lost there. Then page two, where you did many senior managers in government, where? Uh, if you come to the Kennedy School of uh, Government, I can understand, unless you are saying that all these programs happened at the Harvard University and Kennedy uh, uh, School. I'm talking of page two, just the top. And then head of chambers, again, you say 2013 to 2017, we don't have start off, we don't have an end date, assuming uh, probably you probably got called to the bar in October. So if you don't state the date, we are minded to think that you started off from uh, January. Uh, Chairman, this will pass as my. And then finally, page three, parliamentary committees and caucuses. You have decided to do a mix. I'm sure at Chairman's pleasure, we could, uh, we could uh, 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 rearrange that and separate caucus from the other. Then 2002 to 2002, uh, item 8, Vice President, Law Students Union. Uh -huh, you see, so Chairman. And then uh, this one, Chairman corrected me, 204 to date in page 4. When you say 204, Chairman will interpret the hyphen there as to date. Mm -hmm. uh, but for our purposes, uh, we would have said that uh, we understand. So congratulations, Chairman, these are my preliminary on the CV. I trust that along the line I can just have two uh, substantive. If she agrees to improve the CV with you, then I can yield, Chairman. Very well, any more issues on the CV? I'm most grateful, Chairman, and uh, congratulations, Honorable Sarah Ajasafo, our Deputy Majority Leader. Honorable Ajosafu, in giving us a profile, a brief profile of yourself, you left out your rather impressive uh, background in procurement law. I want to give you the opportunity to give us a brief on that uh, so that we can all, we can all, we can all appreciate, appreciate that. I mean, I know it's stated on your CV, but can you give us a, a brief profile? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, just to um, um, let the minority leader know that the um, corrections has been taken in good faith. And the Harvard Kennedy School, indeed, the courses that I've listed below are the courses that I took at the Harvard Kennedy School. And then my homeschooling, it's homeschooling, so sometimes it's very difficult that you, you try to arrange it in a normal school curricula. That is why I put the dates that I finished. And then on a book, uh, well, um, on the homeschooling, when you put 1995, what does it mean? That it's only in the year 1995 that you did the schooling at home, or that's the year you 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 completed. <laughs> that is the year I completed, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> you don't remember when you started. Wow. <laughs> right from um, early early childhood, I, I started from home. So, um, pardon me on that one. Honorable Kujia Chabaka, thank you for the opportunity. I hold a master's degree program from the George Washington University in government procurement law. I obtained the degree in 2005. I came back after, after working as an intern in the office of the Attorney General for the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., and went straight to um, Atachia Chamber, Zoya Chen Co. Whilst there, the Public Procurement Authority needed a legal officer. So at the time, I applied, and so for the record, of PPA, I was the first legal officer. I actually set up the whole legal department that has grown into something that we're all proud of today. So that's my procurement background. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Page one of your CV, um, 
I hope you'll agree with us to amend language spoken to languages spoken and written, languages spoken and written. Uh, page two of the CV, uh, you have explained the circumstances under which we have an overlap uh, first legal officer, public procurement authority, Accra Ghana 2007 to 2008, and national service, legal aid board 2006 to 2008. You have explained that, so I'll let that pass. Except on that page to ask if um, you indicate that you are still the head of chambers, SAFO and MAFO, uh, you know the question that will follow. Article 98 and Order 173, do you have a certificate from the committee of uh, members holding office? office? Um, earlier, I indicated that um, we are yet to appear before the committee for certification to practice for this term of parliament. So we did, in, we did it in the past, but we have applied, but the committee I'm very much aware of hasn't sat here. When we are called, we appear to properly get the clearance that is required of us from Right Honourable Speaker. Madam uh, Speaker, if I can have an opportunity to do my substantive. So, Deputy Leader, uh, in the President's appointment letter, he highlights the fact that, and I read 14th May 2017, Honorable Sarah Ajua Safo, Minister of State at the Office of the President, Public Procurement. I want to believe and assume that the President recognizes that procurement globally and probably in Ghana remains a veritable source of corruption and open to abuses that undermines value for money and therefore undermine the taxpayers' uh, money. Will you assure this committee that open competitive tender processes will be the hallmark of your administration in guiding public procurement processes? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would want to reiterate what has already been stated by His Excellency the President on our government's position on procurement in ensuring that there's transparency, fairness, non-discrimination, value for money, and to a very large extent, um, integrity in the procurement processes. And the only way that we can best champion this cause is through open competitive tender. So we believe that open competitive tendering is the way to go to open up the tendering process for as many that qualify or meet the specifications for the contract for which they want to bid for are given the opportunity to do so. I thank you. It's sole sourcing lawful as an avenue for procurement. Well, Mr. Chairman, sole sourcing is permitted under the Act Act 663, as amended by Act 914. It is a, a method that is acceptable under the Act. And to also put it this way... Is it, is it lawful? It is. It is. Thank you. But it is an exception to the rule rather than the general rule. Thank you. Will you encourage and support the President in ensuring that sole sourcing as a mode of procurement is used sparingly and rarely. I will do so, Mr. Chairman. If um, the conditions precedent set out in the Act and the guidelines for sole sourcing as developed by the PPA, conditions must be met. We would only advise if those conditions are satisfied, any one of them, and, are, and it's a pressing need at the moment for sole sourcing to be taken other than open competitive tendering. Thank you. Is this government under your supervision likely to use sole sourcing for any purpose of procurement? Mr. Chairman, this is future futuristic. Likely to, we can't predict that. Can we reframe your question? <laughs> Will sole sourcing be used? 
Mr. Chairman, as indicated earlier, sole sourcing is a method that is justified under the law, provided the conditions precedent exist. One of which, or many, many of these conditions, one include in the event of an urgent situation or an emergency, or where the item being procured would be the sole intellectual property right of uh, a company or of an individual. So going competitive tendering at the end of the day brings you back to the same intellectual property holder. These are some of the conditions under. If we are able to satisfy same, we would, um, where necessary, if the, the, the conditions are met. But Mr. Speaker, on that, we believe that as a government policy, in the 2017 budget statement as read by, his, um, read by the finance minister on behalf of His Excellency the President, he made known to us one of government's policy to ensure that sole sourcing is used for, um, you know, sparingly, Mr. Speaker. He went ahead and told us and to the people of Ghana that we are setting a ceiling of 50 million Ghana cities. This is to say that any entity or government agency, ministry, uh, municipal, uh, metropolitan, who decides to go sole sourcing would have to get a prior justification or approval at cabinet so that we are set in our minds as a government that this is a priority, it is in line with um, government policy and in line with the threshold that has been set by ourselves internally to check ourselves. Thank you. Chairman, just a follow-up. I note that it is estimated that about two billion U.S. dollars uh, goes down the drain as a result of not properly managed procurement process of our country. Part of the challenge of Ghanaian companies is capacity. That when it comes to international competitive bidding, you see a local Ghanaian contractor or a local supplier being placed at the same level with an international company of better standards. What will you do to promote local participation and local benefit of the procurement processes in Ghana? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As rightly indicated by the minority leader, indeed, actually there's a World Bank report that indicates that in developing countries, of which Ghana is one, 70 to 80 percent of our total revenue goes down the drain through procurement. As a country, we have done a lot in reforming our public financial administration system. We have focused on budgeting, and so we enacted the PFM law. In between budgeting and auditing, and the Auditor General is also giving the right to audit what our spendings are as a government. In between budgeting and auditing is procurement. So we need to place as much emphasis on procurement to save our uh, taxpayers' money from going down the drain. It is a government policy, and we stated it in our manifesto. Um, that we would ensure that 70% of all government contracts go to um, locals. And Mr. Speak, Mr. Chairman, this is a way to promote our own, our local manufacturers, suppliers, contractors, and to build their capacity. So if I'm given the nod, together with government, we will create the enabling environment for these contractors who are locals to build their capacity. Again, out of the 70%, it is again government policy, and it is in our manifesto, that 30% of the 70% will be procurement given to uh, companies owned by women, companies owned by pe pe uh, persons who are physically challenged, and again, companies that are established under the Youth Enterprise Fund. So we will work together with the Ministry of Women and Children, the Ministry of Trade, to ensure that we identify some of these companies and encourage them to <laughs> encourage them to bid for government contracts. Thank you. Will you punish entities that will resort to sole sourcing 
outside government advice and position. Mr. Sp Mr. Chairman. A substitute punished for sanction under the law. Will you sanction? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the sanctions are provided for in Section 92 of the Public Procurement Act as amended, and it is so clear. It's been reviewed in the um, amendment, the, the, the fine from 1,000 Ghana CDs to 2,500 Ghana CDs, or imprisonment for not less than five years. So the offense is already in the law. So we would... Will you enforce the sanction? We will work together with the Attorney General's Department to ensure that people who are found or entities found to have flouted the procurement law are dealt with. One, my last, and I should thank you for the indulgence, is to... Is, cap, is cabinet a creation of the Constitution? Rightly so. Cabinet is a creation of the Constitution. Rightly so. How should the Ghanaian people expect to know the cabinet of the president? Honorable, honorable minority leader, <laughs> this is. <laughs> I, I, I know I, where this I've allowed it, so just as I said, it's procuring. <laughs> <laughs> for your information. <laughs> um, a communication actually has to come to um, Parliament, and the President will have to state categorically who, which of his ministers will be part of Cabinet. And I know we had an... Uh, uh, the nominee was a respected member of the Pan-African Parliament. She is. Uh, she is a respected member. With you, Mr. Speaker, you serve on the Pan-African Parliament. Part of their protocol is to strengthen oversight. Do you intend to hold on to that office, and will it be consistent with the Pan-African Parliament protocols? Mr. Chairman, um, the chairman of the committee is the head of the delegation for the Pan-African Parliament, and he's sitting with you, and I know that he would be advised by the protocols accordingly. Thank you. Well, um, the nominee is a leader of the House, and uh, we must follow the tradition when leaders appear before us. So, um, or we're allowed to on either side. Uh, on either side, I'll pick one lady and one gentleman, or one honorable member. So. I've asked the leadership to guide me on the minority side who to pick. And then, <laughs> so, as, which one? Honorable Helu. Okay, Honorable Helu. That's the um, Thank you, Chair. And Congratulations. Uh, you are really a role model for women, especially young women. <laughs> and we know you will bring your expertise to bear on your new position. So congratulations once more. Thank you. I just have a short question. Uh, how do you reconcile your position with that of the Public Procurement Authority? so that the authority of the procurement authority is not undermined. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and uh, Mr. Chairman. My role will in no way conflict with that of the Public Procurement Authority. It will rather go to strengthen and empower the Public Procurement Authority to be the regulatory body that oversees um, public procurements that are done. What I would be doing is to be advising government on procurement issues. I wouldn't veer into the regulatory functions of PPA. Mine is just to advise as an internal check for us as a government, even before we move to public procurement for the needed approvals that we ought to get for sole sourcing 
or for restricted tenure. Thank you. Um, and the majority said, who wants to ask a question? Okay, so Barbara. Congratulations, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Barbara. We are so proud of you. Um, since we came to Parliament, you've been our mother and our role model, and we're so proud of you. After my schooling at the law school and gaining my barrister law certificate, I decided to read a master's program. I wrote to a number of universities and they brought me their brochures to indicate which courses they offered. I chanced on public procurement. I read about it. It was a very new area, very technical. I wanted something that was challenging. So I decided to take that course, and I bet you the first two months <laughs> in Washington, D.C. wasn't easy. But I don't regret one bit for challenging myself to read a course that was not known. I remember my professors who were doing my recommendations kept asking, are you sure of what you're going to do? Because they have to write their recommendations based on what uh, my, my experience has been with them at the academic, academic level. And they never chanced on anything procurement, so they were wondering. But that is my inspiration. I got there, and I didn't regret. And I must say that when I, kept, I got back at the PPE, I was part of the team that moved for the amendments of PPB Public Procurement Board, the change in the legal status of Public Procurement Board to the current Public Procurement Authority, to give it that. And then again, in the United States, within the Attorney General's Department, they also have the Appeals and Complaints Panel for uh, contracts, um, um, aggr aggrieved members who are uh, uh, contracted or suppliers. And when I came back, I prepared uh, 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 a proposal for the then chief executive of PPA, uh, who is still the PPA boss, uh, who was my boss then, and he bought into the idea. So as we speak now, we have the appeals and complaints panel within PPA, where aggrieved contractors can go in when they are grieved. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. What will be the three legacies you will be remembered with? Um, I, I would want to be remembered for, for the three main um, policy initiatives of my government on procurement that at the end of the day, we would have more women bid for government contracts, give them a level playing field. And again, people challenged or physically challenged, the youth and then also locals also bid for many of our government contracts. This is the legacy I want to leave behind. Thank you. Uh, uh, if I understand you, um, if, if we approve you to become the minister, you'll be advocating for work, more women to do government contracts and, and people with disability. Okay, I wanted to understand whether you're going to dislodge the men or... or <laughs> Leader suggested some names to me, but now I have three hands all of it. I don't know, even though the leader suggested one name to me. <laughs> so, that of leader must start very well. In that case, I mean. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairman. Uh, I will just uh,
conclude with the CV, page three and page five. Just be avert your mind to appointments committee on page three, and uh, honourable attach uh, name your referee. Uh, his attire is without an H, yes. So thank you for that. My first question will be from the Public Procurement Act 2003, Act 63, and the Public Procurement Amendment Act 2016, Act 914, which you have referred to severally, and I know you are very familiar with these two acts. A careful reading of the act suggests that the Public Procurement Authority is under the Ministry of Finance. And indeed, if you look at Section 13 of the Act, the board is supposed to submit an annual report to the finance minister. And uh, Section 98 and the interpretation indicates clearly that anywhere you see minister in the Act means the minister responsible for finance. Now we are having for the first time a minister for public procurement, which was not contemplated by the Act that regulates the sector. Uh, wouldn't you say that your role, you will get in the way of the finance minister, and this will create uh, tough, tough problems and tough wars, which would not really help the uh, procurement practice of our country? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I do not think that I will veer into that arena. As I indicated earlier, my role will be restricted to advising government on procurement internally before we move to the next level, which is PPA regulating to see whether indeed, as a government, we have followed the right procedures. So I would not veer into the arena of the role of PPA or the Minister for Finance. Thank you. So if I'm understanding you clearly, the Public Procurement Authority will not be under you? Otherwise, I guess he has a follow-up. Yeah, um, congratulations, Honorable Safo. Will you, will you recommend that the President brings uh, an amendment to this act which enables him to assign any minister to oversee public procurement, which then makes your ministry capable of overseeing it. Will you recommend that the president quickly brings an amendment to parliament so that he can assign any minister? I, if this house approves my nomination, I believe that I will have the needed interaction with his excellency, the president, and he will direct on the way to go accordingly. Thank you. Well, Mr. Question, my uh, Mr. Chairman, my second question, uh, pardon me, my, my second question has to do with um, the responses you have been given about how you want to be remembered, uh, that you want to be remembered, that you opened up the procurement space that allowed for more women, uh, women in business, people in disability and all of that. What will you say to governance experts who may raise the issue of ethics, that you being a minister of state in charge of procurement, and at the same time going out of your way to advocate and look for women in business to come and apply for government contract, and you are the advisor to the president on procurement. Doesn't this raise ethical issues, isn't it? untidy. Uh, shouldn't you be staying away from who wins government contracts? Because you are advising the president on procurement. And at the same time, you want to be known as the champion, the advocate of women, people with disability, who will be uh, taking place, uh, who will be taking part uh, in the procurement process. Uh, doesn't this raise ethical issues uh, which may even bother on uh, conflict of interest and uh, abuse of office. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I do not foresee that um, conflict occurring. The reason I say so is that government has promised the people of Ghana 
of certain policies that ought to be implemented. This policy of 70% being locals and out of the 70%, 30 being women, is a government policy. We might probably have to come by legislation, like the way we have the local content for the energy sector. If we are doing that, and I'm championing that cause, we are only creating the enabling environment and to let women be aware that this is to enable them to also strive and be competitive in the procurement arena. And not that I will be going, picking and choosing who wants to come. Again, the uh, companies or enterprises established under the Youth um, um, Enterprise Fund, these are already companies that exist. So if they are made aware that government has such a policy, and some of them are women, we just create the enabling environment to that local content bill that probably will have to come to parliament for. And precedent has been set in the energy sector, so I think that this honorable house will do the same. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my final question. Honorable uh, to you entitled to two. two. Um, the last question will come from the majority. Okay, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, Honorable Ajoa Safwa. Thank you, Honorable Member. Ajoa Safu. Thanks for the correction, Honorable Linabdi. Honorable, how relevant is contract administration in the effective performance of government contracts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Contract administration is very, very relevant and important in the effective enforcement or implementation of a government contract. Much emphasis um, lately is being placed on contract administration because we've noticed that many a times after contracts are signed, and especially, for example, in the case of works, um, contractors take over the sites and start. You realize that because there's no um, um, contract administrator on field to ascertain and actually check, monitor, that contracts are being done according to specification and within the timelines that are stipulated in the contract, you see that many a times government will have to go back and readjust on time and sometimes we pay more or would have to go back and uh, re renegotiate with the contractors on this um, increment that comes on top of the actual contract sum. So if we place more emphasis, and I believe that is the thinking and the reason why the amendment in the Act 914 brought into being the role of a contract administrator to ensure that um, the user um, department, the person or the department within the entity that are um, um, interested in that contract are actually in there to administer that the contract comes to a conclusive um, stage before they pull out so that we can ensure that there's value for money and we don't get many increments in the actual sum due to price variations or delays in the contract performance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So, uh, could you assure this committee and Ghanaians that with your tenure in office, we are going to maximize the use of uh, sole source and at least to the benefit of Ghanaians? We will minimize so, and that is why we have set it um, as an agenda in this government that it, we check ourselves internally by providing that ceiling. And any entity that wants to procure, and that it's cut within that um, um, ceiling, we have to realign and make sure that it's within the stipulated contract sum that ought to come to cabinet for prior approval before it goes to PPE. This is a way of also checking and to make sure that we follow the, the law and the rules and the guidelines to social sourcing as developed by PPE. 
and I can assure Ghanaians that we will min minimize the, the use of the method so so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we will come to the leadership, but I'll also you there have a question on the CV. I'll allow you on that. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, that, uh, for being so gracious. I'm grateful. Honorable nominee, congratulations. Thank um, you. If I had the chance, I would have asked another question, but Chairman has limited me to the CV, so I'll just stick to that. But um, they say you don't talk of uh, or ask a lady's age in public, but I just want to be sure that uh, this is not what used to be called football age. If it is not football age, then I want the nominee to be a stop from calling me a small boy because I'm four years older than her. Well noted, Mr. Chairman. Only four years. <laughs> only four. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I proceed? <laughs> it's not only. Four years is not only. It's a, it's a whole term, in fact. <laughs> it's a whole term. Mr. Chairman, can well, well I? noted, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, just a quick one, because it's procurement, and we know that she's the daughter of a very popular uh, inventor in Ghana. Look at around here. All the questions have been asked the majority. You said CVs were allowed you. Don't extend your boundaries, please. Now, right, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to take the opportunity to congratulate our colleague uh, even though we have a rule that when you are in leadership, we, the committee normally will be very lenient. You know, she has not stayed long in leadership to root herself in the leadership. So she has to be treated. She has to be treated. I just look at your CV and on page three, item number six under the leadership position held. National Campaign Coordinator for Candidate Nana Adodankwa Akufado 2014. Is that correct or there's a typo there? You were the National Campaign Coordinator for the Candidate Nana Adodankwa Akufado 2014. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, yes, the internal primaries um, that um, allowed uh, President His Excellency to become the flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party. I was the national coordinator. Were you a campaign. member of the national coordinating team or the team leader? Rather. I was the member, yes. That clarification you wanted. Oh, that clarification is what he wanted. Okay, yes. well noted. I just wanted to be sure that whether you were the coordinator or you were a member of the team. Well, so that leads me to what are the major procurement policies you think MPP government will want to rule? Since you've been a campaign coordinator or a part of the team, you've been moving with the president. So what are some of the major procurement policies that you think the MPP government will want to rule over the next four years? Thank you. Um, as earlier indicated, the 70% government contracts going to local, we want to create an, an enabling environment to promote local contractors to also bid. And then out of the 70 is 30%. Again, we would want to ensure that um, sole sourcing and restrictive tender as methods under the Procurement Act are used sparingly, and in doing so, set a, a, a ceiling. And so my outfit would also want to realign and collate all such procurement um, um, plans to ensure that it is in appro uh, it's appropriate and in line with government policy. These are some of the things that, as a government, we want to roll out to, in to instill in the Ghanaian people the integrity that ought to be in the procurement process. Mr. Chairman, is she aware by the Procurement Act amended that all the agencies have their entity committees, almost even including government machinery? 
face of it as an entity that monitor and ensure their procurement process. How will you, sitting in the office of the president, be able to determine what, say, Kumasi Academy, my constituency, procurement entity, what they do with regards to whether they are going to do sole sourcing, whether they are going to go through open tender, how would your office be able to influence that, knowing the thousands of entities that we have across the country? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, what my outfit will do and work with will be as sectorial ministers. As indicated earlier, for soul sourcing, it has to come to cabinet. And they will all be there at cabinet meeting with the president. And the details will have to be given if it's within that ceiling that has been set as indicated by the finance minister in the 2017 budget, which is 50 million Ghana cities. So if it is above that, we believe that the ministers will alert cabinet accordingly and the right prior approval is given so that internally we satisfy ourselves that the process is not being abused before it steps out of uh, government to PPA, which is the regulatory body, who would sit down and look law by uh, provision by provision its own guidelines on sole sourcing to see whether we have also um, 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 complied with the law. We don't want the situation, if you look at the PPA's report, 2013, 2012, 2014, the numbers on sole sourcing approvals, we believe we can work and bring it down. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Chairman, she was talking about the sector ministers. You know that, for example, if you take the Minister of Health, that I'm very familiar with. They have approximately about nine major agencies. And per the Procurement Act, they have ceilings that they can handle within their agency without necessarily even getting to the, ministeria, the ministers or at the ministerial level. How will you sitting in your office be able to determine? Because the ministers themselves will not even know because per the law, they do not need to get to the ministerial level. How will the, you know, if the ministers will not know, not alone you, that say Food and Drugs Authority, that has to procure some reagent that can only be manufactured by one particular company, and therefore in they are doing, and the ceiling is not above what they can do at their agency, and therefore send it to the ministerial level. How will you know that they are doing this at that agency when they are within the law to, with their ceiling? How will you be able to regulate that? That That is why my outfit would be um, coordinating mostly with PPE and also working together with PPE. The ent entity tender committees, I agree, do exist. The plans must go. PPE checks. They have to also file the same procurement plans with PPE. And actually, the Act 914 mandates them to also post it on their website of PPE. So these are all checks that are already there. We don't want to duplicate that that already exists. So the thresholds for each MMDA, MDA, is spe already specified in the law. What we are seeking to do is that with sole sourcing, mostly the amounts are huge. How do we check ourselves as a government? so that we don't restrict the process to only one person, to raise eyebrows by the public, but to open it up when need be. And that is why we have also set a ceiling within ourselves for high value contracts. So the contracts that are within the threshold are specified in Act 914, which has been reviewed upwards. And um, I think it is in the right direction they have to satisfy those thresholds anyway. And PPA would also have to regulate whether they are complying or not. That is not what I seek to do. Thank you. So by what you've just said, I mean, the PPA is regulating all these agencies and what have you. Now, if they decide not to do so sourcing, with the greater respect, then what would the office be doing? Come again. If, like you yourself rightly said, 
all these agencies the ppa is supposed to regulate them and they are supposed to publish even on their websites and they are complying and ppa is supervising so what will your ministry then do what will your office then do mr chairman you asked the question in respect of procurement plans and i restricted my answer to procurement plans so that was what i was saying that the procurement plans this is what the law says and pp actually regulates them so i did not well i didn't ask about procurement plan i was just asking that agencies have their entities and they have their thresholds until they go above their threshold where they have to move to the ministerial level they handle it at their level so even the ministers will not even know that those procurement are happening because it is within their threshold and i was asking that sitting in the office of president how will you be able to regulate that and you then said that uh, the procurement act they are supposed to have their procurement plan they are supposed to even publish it ppa is supposed to ensure that they are complying and i said okay so if ppa is going to ensure all this what will the office be doing then my office will be to advise the president on government procurement issues and any issue that comes to the attention of the president that he needs expert opinion or direction on i will do so thank you okay mr chairman I just want to find out from my colleague. She's been a legal advisor at the PPA before, right? It's in your CV. Rightly so, Honorable. On the average, how long does it take for, averagely, for the process to get completed, say for a procurement process to get completed from the start to the end? Right. It, it actually depends on which kind of procurement, whether it's works, whether it's goods or whether it's services. But uh, ideally, it would take a few months. Oh, I just say <laughs> averagely. Averagely, having had the experience. Yes. Averagely, do you think it would take about how long? A month. Okay. So, so now, would your, let's assume that averagely a month. Now, would your office, Minister of Finance, cabinet do you think it is going to shorten or lengthen the process of procurement we will work as much as we could to expedite the entire process okay mr chairman you know uh, your daddy is doing so well with inventions and creating a lot of good things vehicles and what have you electronic gadgets and uh, as a, a Ghanaian company that uh, as a country will have to encourage just like Japan did with Toyota, like America did with Ford. Do you think if procurement is going to be open all the time, your father's business can never get flourished? Because then it has to compete with uh, Toyota, it has to Nissan and 